Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, Lunch and Learn. I am so excited to be welcoming Peter Boyce, who is over here. Uh, Peter, thank you so much again for joining. How's your day going? It's so good. Yeah, thanks again, Liz, and the entire WAVE team for having me. This is a blast for lunch. Uh, yeah, um, I, I thank you again for joining. I know you're crazy busy. You sit on a lot of boards. You advise a lot of companies, so this is awesome. Um, so. I'd love to start off with, you know, we're around the same age. So some of the people we've had on here have 30 years of experience, some maybe closer in college than like we are. So I'm curious, can we just start off with like, who was Peter in college? What were you like? How would your friends have described you? How'd you spend your time? What did you want to be? Totally. So, you know, when I came into school, I wanted to be a physicist. You know, I thought I was going to get a PhD someday and, you know, I was going to do research and be a professor. That did not turn out to be the case. Uh, so really quickly after my freshman year, and I think this is how folks ended up did, you know, really coming to know me, I spent all my time in student groups, you know, starting student groups, supporting friends on student groups. I love collaborating with folks outside of the classroom. Um, and I love working on side projects um, and kind of, you know, computer science projects with friends. So I was always kind of taking over you know, kind of random rooms in like the CS department, you know, ordering in, you know, food and having speakers come. Um, so, so I think folks remember me as I was always like hosting an event, you know, I was uh, rarely in my classes, I think, uh, you know, for, for folks that, you know, remember me uh, in a way. I was in the classes I really loved, you know, around like um, entrepreneurship and, and science uh, and, and, and a few other subjects. But um, yeah, I think I was like the, the organizer, you know what I mean? I just wanted us all to always be coming together and working on projects together. I love how different each of the answers we get from that is. Some people say I was always in the library. Some people, we just had the CTO of Starbucks on Thursday and she was like, I was always in the library. So it's always fun to hear the different answers. Um, that's great. So. So you wanted to be something that today you are not, at least as far as I know, you are in a quite a different profession. So talk to me about how you ended up getting into the world of venture capital. Yeah, totally. So for me, it was, a, I think the, the journey involved, really, it was kind of like a natural evolution. I kind of got pulled into it in a way. So by starting two student groups on campus focused on helping, you know, kind of fellow students launch companies and launch startups. Um, I kind of naturally ended up in, in, in conversation with, you know, venture investors. Um, so I, I was inviting them to come and speak at some of the events, to be mentors, to be sponsors. And so I had this kind of natural way that I, I got connected to the world of, of, of VC. And, you know, one of the things that I think came out from that is, um, you know, number one, I kind of, I, I was able to see the role that they were able to play in kind of shaping the, the learnings and the outcomes for, for my friends that were starting companies. Um, and then number two, I was also super excited to and super lucky that a lot of those folks that I was spending time with, they were making introductions for me. So when I was thinking about my summer internships and things like that beyond, you know, a lot of the folks that I was, you know, inviting to speak and sponsor and to support these events on campus, you know, that was also another way I got exposed to venture. So for me, literally, it was a, I helped uh, an investor organize a dinner for one of their portfolio companies as a thank you, he sent me a follow-up email, said, hey, you know, I know this really great CEO in New York. You want to, you know, a place to like, you know, maybe hang out and work for the summer. Um, and then I ended up working at uh, that startup Skillshare in New York. Um, and then I worked with the CEO on the fundraising process. And I got to know a lot of the, the venture community in New York that way. You know, I was kind of like the you know, Mike's kind of sidekick for, for fundraising. So, um, so that's really how I got, I was super lucky to get introduced to venture kind of a few different ways, but it was really through the student group, you know, work on campus, um, through my internship opportunities, um, and then also, you know, mentors, which I'm sure we'll get some time to talk about, but um, I was super lucky to get introduced to a few folks that really kind of helped show me the ropes too when I was a sophomore. Awesome. So I have to ask, I have a feeling if I were to ask everyone on the audience to like, raise their hand. Who here has ever watched an episode of Shark Tank? Probably the majority would say yes. So with that, I'm curious, is being a venture capitalist basically Shark Tank? What's different? Like, what are some of the misconceptions about working in venture capital? Yeah, for sure. So what's great is Shark Tank does give you like a pretty good baseline mental model for what venture is. Uh, let me maybe, maybe add a few pieces of fun nuance. I think 
you know, number one, the notion of royalties is a part of the venture deal doesn't really exist. So anyone who's ever seen, oh, and by the way, I want 1% of all your future sales, that is not typical in a venture capital deal. So that's, that's maybe a small detail, but the kind of thing that, you know, I've never talked about, you know, in my, in my venture career. Um, I think the second piece is, you know, we look at both, you know, consumer uh, good businesses, but we also, we mostly look at software businesses, right? So these are, you know, whether they are uh, healthcare platforms, financial services platforms, uh, you know, consumer software, but it's a lot more, you know, apps and, and, and kind of, you know, use of, of engineering talent. So a little bit less kind of the, the small business of making a product that then gets distribution and retail. We do some of that, you know, like we're lucky to be investors in, in companies like Warby Parker um, and, and Outdoor Voices and others, but, um, but mostly it's, you know, software businesses that you may or may not have ever heard of because they're, you know, powering, you know, X, Y, or Z at a company. Um, but I think it's a good example. And I think the last thing I'd say about, you know, Shark Tank is, um, it does present a little bit of the collaboration com competition dynamics in venture capital, which is oftentimes, you know, whether it's within your partnership or within the broader venture community, you are having these kind of almost kind of like frenemy moments, you know, where you're like, oh, I love this so much. I want to do the deal myself or, oh, let's do it together. You know, that is a very real dynamic in venture. I think that's a, that's a fun um, aspect you get exposed to in, uh, in Shark Tank. And I'm curious, someone asked like, how do you, so Amy from Wisconsin asked, what makes you qualified to advise a company? Like why, why should a startup to say to any VC who, who doesn't have operating experience, like uh, of running their own company, you know, why you should take your advice. And on the flip side, what makes you, any venture capitalist, you, not just you, but you in general, qualified yeah. to like decide whether to give someone money i'm curious like how do you learn yeah. how to do that you know you you go to med school to become a doctor so what do you do to become a vc and be qualified yeah it's a, it's a great question there 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 are different schools of thought on this topic which is kind of which is kind of fun um and then you know one of the things i'll do is i'll connect back to how in 2020 things are a little bit different than in the past so i would say if, if we were having this conversation in 1999 or you know 2005 you know, a venture capitalist had operating experience, founding experience, personal wealth, and, and, the, and, and a lot of the personal achievements at the individual level that you might say, you know, would be a good profile for kind of being like a coach to future founders, right? That, that, that's, I think, the traditional kind of approach to, to venture capital. Um, I think what's really interesting and exciting to me is, um, you know, there are a whole host of ways investors can support founders. Um, you know, one of them is from sharing about their lived experience. That's, that's actually just one of many, many other ways, right? So I'll give you a few examples, helping on recruiting, you know what I mean? Like you can have an incredible network of engineers, friends you went to school with, classmates, you know, folks you, you, you like physically grew up with, you know, oh, she was always the best at X, you know what I mean? Let me shoot her an email. Like, so, so I think one is around just kind of, you know, is the talent piece of the equation. Um, and so the second would be, I mean, sometimes it's just about being empathetic and, and understanding what a founder is going through. And I think you can be empathetic whether you've been in a founder's shoes or an operator's shoes or not. Um, I can tell you from having run the, the student groups in, in college that I did, I mean, I developed, I think, a tremendous amount of empathy kind of just working alongside my friends who were starting companies. Like, I felt like I was really like a part of their journeys. And when they were succeeding, I was feeling great, you know, cheerleading them on. And like when things were complicated, I was like, I was also kind of down in the dumps with them. So, so that was the way that I developed, you know, founder empathy from that experience. And then my, also my, my work experience at the, the startup Skillshare that I mentioned. Um, I think the third piece is, you know, everyone can have a prepared mind for how and in what ways, you know, the future of technology is going to unfold, right? And in so many ways, I mean, you've seen, you know, young people do this and they've started companies, right? You know, at a really kind of, you know, early parts of their career. So folks have been able to reinvent the way people connect online and, you know, get access to financial products. So like, think about Stripe, you know, getting started by, by very young entrepreneurs, rethinking, you know, the, the financial financial system on the internet. Um, you don't have to have, you know, 20 years of experience to do that. They certainly did not. Um, so I think I like to flip into this mindset also of just, um, what are your, you know, unique superpowers? What do people look to you for? Um, and oftentimes in that answer, you can find ways to be helpful to, to, to founders. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, 
uh, many of the best investors in the world have no operating experience and no founding experience. And so, so one of the things that I hope to be doing, you know, knock on wood, you know, fingers crossed is um, if you just build reps doing the thing that you want to be really incredible at, you can be, you know what I mean? Like you can basically just over index on just that activity. And so there are a handful of us in the venture community that have just kind of been doing, you know, venture, you know, since we've been, you know, uh, since we've been working. And so, um, so I'm encouraged and excited about that, but there aren't that many historic examples because the venture industry didn't really used to be organized that way. And so um, what's great is it's now, you know, there are plenty of analyst programs you can go and be a part of like right out of school. And so you can kind of hop right into a venture career in a way that you couldn't get in the past. Amazing. So you're actually segueing me quite nicely into my next question. So now that everyone on this call has heard that they too can become venture capitalists, but yes. they haven't started billion dollar companies. Um, Talk to me about what an entry-level VC job is like. You mentioned that there's a lot of analyst programs out there. They're obviously incredibly difficult. And even though you did work for a couple of years out of college, you still entered into General Catalyst, which is a top VC firm in the world at a pretty young age. And so, like, what was it like at the very beginning? Are you writing checks? Or are they just giving you millions of dollars to spend yeah. however you want? What are you doing with most of your day? Yeah, it's good. It's good. I mean, that's a, that's a good image, by the way. Um, so first off, I'm incredibly lucky, you know, the General Catalyst, you know, kind of team took a chance on me so early on, um, and I'm so grateful for it. So, you know, in your early parts of your career in venture, you're typically spending time a few different ways. Number one, you're sourcing. So that's reaching out to founders, reaching out to companies that might be really interesting. So that's, whether that's, you know, an interesting list, these are the 100 enterprise companies in New York you should get to know, or, you know, these are the 30 fastest growing healthcare companies across the country. So. So a lot of it has to do with just getting in the information flow. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, um, young people, you can, you can be in the information flow as though you're a full-time venture investor or founder today. You know what I mean? Like if you read TechCrunch, Business Insider, you know, you've got an active Twitter account, you've got RSS feeds, you know, so you can, and I, I would definitely encourage you to start building that baseline knowledge because the sooner you start and just keep adding to it, adding to it, it just becomes like a second nature routine and you're, all of a sudden, you know all the names, you know all the founders, you know all the companies. Um, and so I, that was something that I was super lucky for. You know, like when I was graduating, I wasn't, oh, what should I be reading? It was like, you know, I had my like Feedly RSS reader with, you know, all the different blogs and, and, and article sources. So, so I think that's one. So get in the information flow so that you can then be really prepared to be sourcing because a lot of the, the early part of your career is sourcing. The second piece is around diligence, right? So basically supporting on the, the research to help inform a decision and that gets back to the prior question Liz which is just you know how can you be qualified for making some of these decisions oftentimes it has to do with the research that you're doing on the company the space in which they're operating um, other industry experts that can share a perspective with you um, and so when you triangulate all those different sorts of data I, you know you can be you know wherever whenever whoever you know what I mean if you can read the tea leaves from all of that work you can make an informed recommendation um, and by the way, we often get it right or wrong, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, data is only so good and, you know, so much of venture, you know, I think it's just, um, <laughs> you know, it's up to, up to chance uh, in a way. So, so that's the second piece around diligence. Third is, I think, really around helping inform some of the, if a firm has a particular thesis, you know, theses of interest or thematic areas of interest, often doing research in support of that. So, you know, at General Catalyst, we've been spending a, a, a lot of time here thinking about the future of healthcare, and we've made it, you know, kind of manifest in, in a lot of our investments recently and historically. And so that's an area where I and others, you know, have been kind of actively contributing to this kind of body of work internally so that we collectively can make better decisions and, and, and have a point of view with respect to the future of healthcare. And that's something that, you know, a young person, you know, joining the team can kind of start contributing to day one. And this is where it's like, you know, if you happen to be studying from med school, you know what I mean? And like wanted to kind of, you know, shift gears a little bit, that's going to come in handy, you know, and whatever you're studying, you know what I mean? It could be the future, you know, art marketplace, you know, like that's an area that I'm fascinated by. And so if someone was studying, happen to be studying art history and happen to spend a summer in a gallery, you know, there's, there are all different ways to basically take your background and take your passion areas, turn them into superpowers, and then contribute them to a venture firm. But those are the three kind of key awesome. areas that I would say are, are where you know early early investors are are, are sharing their time at a, at a venture firm. 
Awesome. And uh, to everyone watching, I'm going to switch over to the Q&A in a minute because you guys are asking amazing questions. Um, but I'm curious as to, you, you're talking about entering, uh, you know, a VC firm, what you do all day. It sounds like a lot of sourcing, a lot of almost sales in, in that way or marketing or research or diligence. So how does someone at the entry level in a VC role really stick out? Like, how does someone rise the ladder and, you know, climb the ladder, I mean, and, uh, you know, stand out to more senior leadership? Are there things that you've seen analysts do that really has helped? Yeah, it's a great question because I think that this set of, of options uh, and opportunities on this front are widening, which is great. So I see standout things are, I think, uh, number one is just bringing your personal, you know, network to bear to the extent that you have one in a particular area where you think the firm that you're joining may be interested and feel free to go deep. You know what I mean? Like you can say like, literally like I went to middle school with this person. I checked on LinkedIn, you know, the company's got 20 people. It looks like it's a thematic area we're interested in. Like, you know, like that level of like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to reorient, you know, my like universe of resources and support. So I love seeing that when someone texts me, Hey, I was at a dinner with my cousin. She's starting a company. Mentioned wanting to raise a seed round. Like, is that something we're interested? So that's one. I think this the second piece is um, just really I think doing um, being I think a, a team player and collaborative across the team in which you work. I think is really important. So typically, you know, you may be working with one or two or three people in particular. But I always think there's this really interesting kind of opportunity to go just you know, take like 10% of your time and, and kind of, you know, invest it in other areas or other people at the firm. Um, just because I think you can learn more quickly that way. It, it just signals curiosity. Um, uh, and I think it's just an, an opportunity that's available if, if folks want to take it. So, um, so I, that, I pay a lot of attention to that, you know, even with the, the, the summer interns, you know, that we have here at General Catalyst. Um, I think the, the, the third is to, to get comfortable with a contrarian or unpopular or kind of like maybe underappreciated point of view. Um, you can't do it all the time. You don't need to do it all the time. You don't need to build your, you know, your entire, you know, reputation around that. But it's a, it's a phenomenal way, I think, to build credibility and get out, you, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. But I found that um, if you're able to basically put a stake in the ground and say, you know what, I've been spending all my nights and weekends, you know, really noodling how and why this particular, you know, part of an industry is changing. And I'm like, I don't know what it is, you know, but I'm doing these kind of calls in my free time to like figure that out. And all of a sudden, if you come back to the table, like with this like super fresh, like, oh my gosh, like that was mind expanding. Who knows if it's true, but it's a point of view that none of us had. Like, I think that's a you know, again, and it could be anything, you know what I mean? Like you, it could be a consumer trend, people, all my friends keep buying plants, you know what I mean? So there must be something going on there, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, my mom is helping take care of her aging parents and it seems like the software solutions there are totally, you know, non-existent. Like maybe there's white space there. Just like have one of those, you know, kind of areas where you have a point of view and you can kind of, you know, educate uh, and inform the rest of your colleagues, I think, can go a long way. And never let your age experience, anything like that, hold you back. You just got to step out of your comfort zone and know that folks before you that have done that have made, you know, their careers, you know, in some of those moments. So get excited and inspired. Awesome. Amazing. Um, the last question that I'll ask of mine, but it also goes into a question from an audience member. Um, so getting into venture capital often does mean through connections and that further perpetuates a lot of the racial stereotypes around VCs that most VCs are white. Um, you know, coincidentally, the two people who work in venture capital in this Lunch and Learn series are both people of color, yourself and Michael Seibel, uh, the CEO of Y Combinator, who we also had on. And so Clearly, there are ways to get in as a non-white man, but I have to ask, like, what do you think, and, and uh, Matthew from King's College uh, asked why you think that there aren't more Black VCs out there, what we can do to get more people of color into venture capital, and then my mm -hmm. question is, like, what advice do you have for those watching who want to get in who might not have all those connections? Totally. So let me start by giving you my like one of my, my, one of my largest bodies of work kind of, you know, pertains to this, you know, maybe not so explicitly, but implicitly. So one of the last things I worked on when I was in college is I started a fund called Rough Draft Ventures to invest in student-led startups. And a big part of that work for me was 
you know, students are in the know, they're starting companies, their friends are starting companies. How do we empower them to support their networks and their ecosystems? And how do we kind of flatten and democratize access to angel funding, which because, you know, if you don't have an uncle, you know what I mean, who's uber wealthy and is just going to cut you the check, you know, and if you don't go to Stanford and hang out in Koopa Cafe and have Stanford alumni kind of like bump into your table and say, hey, what are you working on? Oh, I worked on that. You know, here's your check. Like, not everyone has that, right? I did not have that. Um, and so I was obsessed with like, you know, how do we, you know, kind of just, again, for folks that are passionate about company building, like how do we get them the resources and how do we, you know, enable young people to do that from wherever, you know, their background is. So uh, I could spend more time on that, but like that was like my commitment to trying to figure out ways to just abstract age, gender, socioeconomic background from this and just create much wider access. So, um, and I'm really proud of that because we've backed over 300 companies so far and we work with students and these students, we give wow. them their first exposure to venture capital and then they go and work at venture firms, they go and found companies and I couldn't be more proud and delighted so um so that's definitely a way you know that many of you you know can get involved uh, on this call so and i would love that um so to get to this point you know i think so the the, the there are structural reasons for how and why the, the diversity of venture capital is the way it is in 2020 which is and it gets back to a point i mentioned earlier which is just think about you, you we have to, you always have to kind of turn back the clock a little bit you have to think about okay you know, the internet industry gets started, you know, kind of late 90s in a way. If you want to go back and, you know, talk about, you know, semiconductors, we can do that. But each step of that way, you had a small group of, of folks that were, you know, kind of like mostly, you know, white males that were, you know, either coming out of research institutions and then and software institutions. And so the issue with that is wealth um, and, and networks compound. And this would, this would be my like key, key insight to share, which is, um, there are certain aspects of your life that compound without you really necessarily feeling it. Um, this is why we always talk about how important it is to save, you know what I mean? Because of compound interest and over time, the same thing happens with, you know, networks and job opportunities. It's just like they compound over time, right? So the more interesting people, diverse people you have in your network over time, like that diversity kind of compounds. But if you don't have that, that also compounds. So the internet industry compounded with a small group of highly educated, you know what I mean, super successful folks. And that was the initial concentration. Those folks then went to create the venture capital firms, you know what I mean? Like, and then, and then they hired from their, their networks, which were their prior software businesses, their alma maters, all that jazz. So that's, that's what sets the stage. Okay. Now let's talk about, you know, the last, you know, call it like, let's say 10 years, right? Where, where folks like Michael and myself and, and others have kind of been invited to participate. I think number one, I think is a, uh, an open-mindedness and an opportunity for folks that have these superpowers, you know what I mean? To basically kind of, you know, rise, you know, above the noise and kind of get attention, excitement, um, and resources and support when they wouldn't have otherwise. And I'd say, Twitter has made this powerful, you know, anyone of any color, gender can go and have a conversation, have a point of view and get incredible support in a place like Twitter. Um, so I think that's one. I think number two is there's been a more consistent investment from mentors and folks to basically kind of, you know, create uh, a little bit of like the ladder and the scaffolding for more folks to enter this industry. And these are folks of all colors, ages and backgrounds. And so, you know, one of my early mentors was Chris Saka. You know, I, I was super lucky to be able to work with him on projects when I was in college. And I chalk up that and another mentor, you know, the chance that they gave me, you know what I mean, as this kind of random college student changed my whole career trajectory. So there's more of those folks. And I am one of those folks for as many of these people, you know, as many of you on this, you know, call as possible. So I think that's number two, which is the pay it forward, invest in the next generation is taking place and it's happening now. The third piece is um, it has to do with the way that folks think about building trust and relationships. So venture capital is so much about trust. It's trust in your colleagues, trust in, in, in the founders that you work with. And one of the, there, there are a few different proxies for trust. One of them is, oh, I went to that alma mater. I know about that dorm experience. You know what I mean? Like already you're instantly more trusting of that person in a way. So you have to think about what proxies for trust are available to you and then which ones you want to basically kind of you know engineer 
right, for yourself. And you can find proxies for trust, you know what I mean, like anywhere, right? Like one of my proxies for trust, sneaker, I was a sneaker collector in high school, you know what I mean? So like I found a, a venture investor who's a sneaker collector, cold emailed, he was so nice to reply, you know what I mean? Like had the conversation, it wasn't about where you went to school, blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh my God, like, you know, we've got this crazy sneaker collection. So, so, so I think part of the, the mindset is, you know, find your, find your superpowers, whatever they are, and find ways to broadcast it to the world in a way that it can't be tethered down. Number two, find your proxy for trust with the people that you want to form relationships with, right? And just and don't bound yourself to the traditional proxies for trust, you know what I mean? Which is, you know, skin tone and, you know, dorm and all that jazz. And like, you grew up in that neighborhood. Uh, and then the third is just recognize that the paid forward, the mentorship investment that's taking place, it's available to all of us, to me, Michael, all of you, uh, in, in, in a scale, in a way that just hasn't happened in the past. And so that's where I'm excited about what this is going to look like as it compounds over time, because I think this is how you're going to have, you know, more diverse perspectives, you know, in, in, the, in the rooms that matter, where the decisions are made. And I think, you know, a few years ago, we saw a conversation open up for how and why, you know, kind of a women needed to be a part of that conversation. And I think there's been, you know, progress, not enough. It will never be enough progress, to be honest. Um, but, um, and I think similarly today, you know, we're having the conversation, you know, um, about people of color. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic. And I would say just the more, the more of the, the more of us that are able to participate, display what success looks like, act as role models for the next generation, right? I think that's gonna be huge because I think the reality of it is Liz didn't have a lot of role models for founding and scaling a business the way that she has. I didn't have a lot of role models, you know what I mean, for being a you know, person of color, you know, partner at a multi-billion dollar venture capital firm. But like now, the next generation has that, you know what I mean? And I think when you can see it, right? And you can see what that success states look like and you can, you know, then you have that opportunity to be like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I can see aspects of myself and that person, I can do it. So anyway, sorry for that. But awesome. I, you know, I, I care a lot about No, I love it. Um, we have so many questions about how you evaluate founders, but before we dive in, the, you, you mentioned rough draft. And so uh, Justin, who is a student at Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, just quickly wanted to know what advice would you give to a student working on starting a VC scout initiative at their own university? And maybe for those who are watching who don't know what a VC scout initiative is, just share for a minute about that first. Too. Yeah, totally. So this is, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. So the venture industry has had lots of different ways it's evolved over the last few years. Um, one of them, I'm super glad to have been a part of it, and, and also friends from Thornland Fund, which is you know, uh, First Rounds Initiative, and many others have kind of expanded, which is, how do you create access to funding for students and, and, and recent grads that are coming off of campuses and want resources beyond the business plan competitions, beyond, you know, and so, and how do you kind of empower students for helping find those companies and support those founders, right, as opposed to you know, me, you know, going back to campus, stomping around, trying to, you know, find my way around, right, which is just, I saw that that can make a lot of sense for other venture investors, and so there's something very authentic and powerful about students doing it. So, so you know, I, I would say, if, and, and what's great about this is it's, it's also just totally boosted the access, right, the access for young people in venture capital is very much getting, you know, expanded by this. So, so I'd say a few things. You know, number one, I would say, you know, find who the investor stakeholders are um, uh, that are that care about like that community that you're in or that kind of, you know, either the alumni from that, 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 uh, you know, that campus, um, the startups that are surrounding your campus, you know, the large scale technology companies, like, I really just find the folks that are going to be kind of like vested stakeholders. Um, you know, for me in Boston, there were a handful of venture firms that didn't really have angel or seed funding, you know, kind of efforts. And so it made a lot of sense for, for them. Um, and that's number one. Number two is find a way to help um, ensure that you have enough startups in the first place. And that's actually, I think, one of the things that folks kind of get the order of operation a little bit backwards, which is um, you want to have great teams to fund before you actually have the, 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 the capital for funding. And so just make sure you've got that criteria, because I see it in the opposite direction a lot. And you don't want to start with capital because then you're going to end up backing a bunch of folks that are kind of voyeurs that are like tourists. Um, and you're, you know, six months later, everyone's going to take the, you know, the, the epic jobs, you know what I mean? And like, they're going to turn off their company. 
Um, the third thing is learn from the other models, right? Like you now have models to learn from, right? So you can email us, Contrary, Dorm Room Fund, Pair, you know, you can look at even some of the campus specific ones. And so, you know, get in touch with them and learn from their model too. Because I, I'll tell you, at Rough Draft, I spent a lot of my time this summer thinking through how do we support an even wider network of campuses, right? So this is like a topic that's top of mind for me. And if I can help, you know, other students kind of create these initiatives, which I spent a lot of time, you know, whether that's, you know, I get emails from, from students all the time that have kind of spun up their own flavors. And I'm, you know, the, I, I, that proliferation, the more, the better for all of us. So, so yeah, just recognize that you've got folks that can give you some of the cheat codes. I love it. And, and we're going to dive in. You, you just mentioned something. Um, Isaac, who's a student at SUNY Polytechnic Institute and is also a summer intern at, I'm going to mispronounce this, but Sonke Capital, F-O-N-C-E Capital. Um, Isaac wants to know, my question for Peter is, what are some of the things that student founders and potential student BCs can do to really stand out in your inbox? So you said you get a lot of emails. I can't even imagine how many emails you get because I know I get a lot and you probably get 100x that. So how are they able to provide value to you and, and what do they do in emails that sticks out versus you saying archive, this is clearly a, a mass email? Yeah, totally. So this is, again, this is, this is advice that I was lucky to get from folks and so, uh, and, and, and tailor it to, to each individual. So, so here's what I'd say, the, the things that stand out to me, um, number one is folks that push value before pulling value. I think this is a key principle, which is just recognize that, you know, most of the people that you're emailing have, you know what I mean, like no free time and any free time they have, they're trying to, you know, like catch up on email and stuff like that. So, so I think push value before you pull. And what do I mean by that? Um, I think, you know, number one, uh, there's so much information available about the type of, you know, whether it's portfolio companies that an investor has or things that they, they care about publicly. So use that information and use that to inform the way, the way that you reach out. So you could see that, oh, hey, you know, one of my portfolio companies just raised a round of financing. Hey, are they hiring? I have three friends, you know what I mean, that like are obsessed with healthcare and I can send them your way. Oh my God. If, if you start your email that way, then whatever, you know, I can do to help in the rest of the email, you know, I'm open for business. So that's number one, which is just find a way to push. And the way that you can push value is just take a quick peek at, you know, and you don't have to be right. You know what I mean? That's like, brilliant. That's just, brilliant. And that's so easy for anyone to do. I love that advice. Okay, sorry. That was totally. number one. What's number two? No, that, and honestly, like, you'd be surprised. You know, it's, it's so easy to skip, but it's magic. You know what I mean? It cuts right through the noise. The second is, is to find those proxies for trust that I talked about, you know what I mean? Whether that's like, you know, hey, you know, uh, I care deeply about New York, you know what I mean, as a technology ecosystem, or I care deeply about this university, I care deeply about this topic, I care deeply about people, just find whatever that proxy for trust is and just use that to basically say, I'm a kindred spirit to you in that way, or I think I am. And that's just, it shows that you're, you're, you've got a point of view, you've done some, you know, you've spent, you know, some time to do some research. I think that's really important. And I think the third is to be, just be open to helping on something. Just say like, you know, hey, I know you don't have any time, you know what I mean? If there's a portfolio project or if there's something that you could, you know, that I could help you on, that I could take off of your plate, you know what I mean? Like, I'd be glad to, you know what I mean? Like, and that's just, don't even necessarily need to take someone up on it. You know what I mean? And you'll find a lot of people may or may not take you up on it, but it's like, you know, for folks, someone emailed me the other day, they're like, you know, Hey, um, uh, I took an aspect of your portfolio page and I reorganized it by geography to see if you'd like that format more. And I was like, never thought about it. Totally cool. Thank you. You know what I mean? Like happy to chit chat. Right. Like, um, or it's like, I love this company. I buy their stuff all the time. I think about it all the time. I'm an evangelist, blah, 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 blah. If there's anything I can do. Like, so I think those are the three ways that I think really help um, folks stand, uh, stand apart. I love that. For, for number two, just so everyone can get an example, because it doesn't have to just stop at college. A couple of years out of college, I think three years out when I started way up or two years out, I really wanted to meet with arguably the person who's the most powerful COO in the world. And so I cold emailed that person after finding in my research that both of us had done a really, really weird that I'm not going to embarrass myself and share a really weird hobby in high school. And so I cold emailed them and in the subject line just wrote, we both used to do X in high school. And I'm sure like there's very few people in the world that do it. And they responded and said, come to my house for dinner tomorrow night. And I was like, oh my God, the person's very famous. So 
I totally hear you on like, sometimes it's just a matter of finding that one similarity. It's, it's so right. And really just don't, don't feel like there are any bounds to the parameters. I mean, one of my first jobs was working at that point entertainment. Okay. That was me being interested in hip hop. You know what I mean? Like that was my qualification. So anyway, just, yeah, just don't. <gasps> Love yeah. it. Okay, so I'm going to combine three people's questions. Um, Harry, from, uh, who's an intern at T-Mobile, Ashley from Wichita State, and Nick, who's a Babson 2020 grad, all had questions that are pretty similar, which is around what the key attributes and qualities you see in founders that convince you to want to invest in them, um, what you look for in a startup in general, I assume part of its yeah. founder, so that's why I'm kind of combining the two, and, and what metrics you're looking at typically when you're looking at a startup. So just around your evaluation of startups. I, I have a feeling all three of them are future founders and entrepreneurs. So maybe that's why they want to know. Good, 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 good. And you, you'll know how to get me. Um, so um, a few thoughts. So I think important way to contextualize this question generally will be depending on the firm that you're, you know, you're interested in or chatting with just, you know, what their reputation is uh, and what stages they focus on, what themes they focus on, that will be a bit of a framing. And then two is the individual at that firm, right? So they're, they're always, always think about venture firms at these two different levels. There's the firm level and then there's the individual level. I think this is really important because um, many firms represent different strategies, different stages, different flavors, so to speak. So think about those two pieces. So, you know, from a stage perspective, I'll, I'll answer because I think for, especially for pre-seed and seed investing, so just investing at the very early stage. So if you're thinking about your first round of financing, you know, as a, as a founder, you know, so much of the evaluation for an investor like me is specifically on the founding team, specifically on, you know, just the characteristics of the team. And then I'll, I'll spend a minute on the second piece, which is I think about like the, the, the market ecology in which you're operating. So just like the market, structure and dynamics that are around you. So well, I'll characterize both those things. So things that stand out to me from a, from a founding team perspective. So number one, uh, love supporting teams when possible, right? So I think, you know, it is so challenging to, to start a business, you know, as a solo individual, you've got super stressful days and, you know, all that jazz. So I, you know, I'm really encouraged when I see either co-founders in the mix as well, or just, you know, the, the early part of the team form. It's like, best, my best friend over here, this woman that I worked with over here, and some advisors, you know what I mean, that we're spending some time with. Like, I like, see, I, I call it being magnetic for talent. Because I think if you're magnetic for talent, that's why, you know, I think even folks that were part of sports teams, you know what I mean, or if you started a student group or ran a student group, like, that's one of the proxies for being magnetic for talent in my mind. Like if you got everyone to focus on the cheese club, you know what I mean? On your campus, like chances are you can get them to focus on, you know, whatever you want. So, so that's one is being magnetic for talent. Um, number two is, is just this speed and rate of learning. So this is like Liz is a superstar example of this. Like Liz is a learning machine. You know what I mean? Like learns from the industry history, executives in this space, has primary conversations with, you know, the, the customer personas, like everyone can be a learning machine. Uh, that's, I think, core. And then finding ways to basically display that, right? So, so what you want to do is you want, because you want to do both things. I think you, you don't want to be a secret learning machine. You want to be a learning machine. And you want to let other, other folks know. And the way that I think about that, I think folks that do almost like public journals about business building like starting their business really is great because you can see some of the ways that the, the founding team is learning there so like the notion documents that i'm seeing getting kind of shared and created where it's like these are the hypotheses that we're cycling through and boop, boop, boop. it's like sometimes just the quality of those notes can tell you everything um and in a universe especially where you don't know where the technology industry is going consumer trends are going, I think it's harder to predict those things, you know, five years, 10 years out. But from my perspective as an investor, if you find a founding team that is going to adapt and evolve, you know what I mean? Like that's going to be able to, you know, get it, you know, get it right. You know, even if the world totally turns upside down, um, I, I like, I like that. Like, so I like, I like the, the team piece. I think the, the third piece is the clarity of vision, right? So, so this is something we talk a lot about. Uh, as a firm and as an industry, which is this notion around like, what does it mean to be first principles thinker? What does it mean to have a very clear vision? So the way that I like to think about this is um, 
um, how much time have you thought about the underlying assumptions in your business? How, how much time have you spent thinking about the things that can go wrong that you are anticipating already? Because chances, if you're thinking about them already and you're anticipating them already, when they arrive and they will arrive, chances are you're going to be better prepared. You know what I mean? So it's like, but you know, if you're like, kind of like, well, we just, you know, we're just going to get this thing out the door and we're going to figure it out. Like that's tactically, yes, that's what we need. But like, you know, when you're in your free time or you're going for a walk, the thinking that you should have is just like, geez, like 10 years from now, if this company doesn't come to fruition, what would be the reasons and why? And that, that process of inversion, I think a lot about inversion, just kind of thinking forward and then like working backwards. Um, yeah. I think that that's really, really helpful to see in the founding team. So that's a, the founding team piece. Like those are a few of the characteristics that I look for. Um, and then the other piece just really quickly is just the, the, the market that you're choosing to operate in. So just what's the general size, you know what I mean? And size in the future, what are the growth dynamics? You know what I mean? Like most of the time, it's really just about the narrative. It's not about like the hard fast, like this is a $10 billion industry. It's more like if you believe that more people are going to do X, Y, and Z, there's going to be an even bigger opportunity and we're going to be, we're going to be there, you know, to deliver on that. So, so I think about the market, the, the competitive dynamics, you know what I mean? Just like, are there, are there like entrenched, you know, monopolies, things like that. And then third is just what are the aspects of a company here that are going to serve as kind of competitive advantages at scale? So I think a lot about just how competitive advantages um, kind of get aggregated. Awesome. Um, before I get into the next question, which really probably is off of what you just said quite well, I have to ask, because I'm very curious myself, Seth from University of Arkansas wants to know, who's your favorite hip hop artist? Since you mentioned you love hip hop. Yeah, this is such a good question. I mean, uh, depends on the period of my life uh, is my is my honest answer. How about today? What, what's your, what's your today, answer for today? It's totally fine if tomorrow is today. Different. You know, who would I say? I would say, I think a tribe called Quest is kind of like a tried and true for me. You know what I mean? It's like, I feel like I can play like their entire albums, you know what I mean? Like front to back all the time. So I love that. But I'd say recently, I mean, Travis Scott, I think it's just been like, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty stunning. Um, and the concert that he did in Fortnite, I feel like I still have like dreams about. <laughs> That's awesome. I actually didn't know he did that. That's really cool. It was um, insane. Okay. So back to um, tech and VC, not that hip hop's not also important, although we do see people saying that they love uh, ATCQ. Um, so how do you identify, uh, Matt, who's a legal internet rapid seven and a law school student at Northeastern wants to know, how do you identify future technology trends or where technology can be further employed to solve issues? Like obviously every trend, every industry is up for disruption, but you mentioned healthcare on here. You've mentioned finance. Obviously, GC's done a lot in fintech. How do you specifically, Peter, think about which industry you want to dive into? Yeah, I think so. So my, my first is I pay attention to where really smart people in my network are starting to spend more time. Like, what, where, what, are, they, what are they getting pulled into in their, like, free time and their downtime? Like, where is their creativity going? So, you know, for example, there, there's definitely a moment in time where a lot of the, the very, you know, kind of smart technologists were gravitating towards applications of the blockchain. And I paid attention to that. And I kind of spent more time with friends, you know what I mean, that were, you know, kind of getting pulled that way. So I think it's just, who are the smart, you know, technologists that you respect? And so what are they getting pulled into? And have them, you know what I mean? Like, I always think about, you know, follow the breadcrumbs they may be leaving. Um, and we have a lot of friends, you know, here at GC, you know, that we kind of have that relationship with. Um, and so, um, and this is another e example where whether it's Twitter, Substack, Medium, or whatever platform, you can also just kind of publicly process, you know, where people, you know, spending time. So that's number one. You know, number two, I like to think about the, um, the it's almost kind of like the, the mega trends that are going to take place over the next 10 to 20 years we may not feel now. So like that's where it's like, you know, just we have certain demographic dynamics that are going to take place over the next 10 to 20 years. They don't feel present at all. But by the time they arrive, you know what I mean? You will have wanted to have built things, you know, in service. Like what's an example? So, you know, I, I kind of mentioned it offhand earlier, but it's like, I think the the role that the 
quote unquote kind of aging millennials are going to play in taking care of their aging parents, I think it's going to be uh, a to I think it's going to be like a like a like a total I tectonic totally agree. shift that no one it, you know what I mean like no one's talking about it right now you know it's like how do we build this offer but like that's going to be a thing and like I'm I'm excited because I think it's going to be something that touches individuals you know what I mean personally and they're going to want to build better software solutions better healthcare solutions better financial services solutions for 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 helping address that and it's just we don't feel it at scale now but we're going to so i like that because you can work on that every day every week and every month you're not going to intersect it you know what i mean next week or next month but when it does you know what i mean like you're going to be like right place right time and everyone's going to look at you and they're going to be like wow how did that happen it's just but by the way, you can be wrong. The world cannot head that direction. That's totally fine. You know what I mean? But clean tech, you know what I mean? In the early 2000s, that was the wrong time. Over the next 10 years, thinking about climate change, you know what I mean? And carbon emissions now actually might be the time, you know? Um, and it's been encouraging and exciting to see more companies thinking about that. So, so those are the two ways that I spent. And then the third is books, which is I read a lot of science fiction, a lot of books. And I use some of the, just like the mental riffs from the, some of the sci-fi books to try to get a picture of the world that we might live in. So I read a lot of like Chinese science fiction, for example, because I think the relationship between privacy and government, and just, you know, it's just, there, I think there are insights there. Um, it, or it allows you to have an imagination and like a creativity for understanding, um, you know, what software companies maybe should be built that aren't already. Um, so I like that. So awesome. Um, I can't believe we've already almost used up our time. So I'm going to end with one final question. Um, I'm going to combine two. One is from Stacey at Penn and one is from Cam, who's a rising junior at the University of New Hampshire and currently a summer analyst at White Mountains Capital. And both of them want to know if someone can't get into VC or, you know, maybe there are other um, other areas that you might want to start in because there are so few roles within VC to start. Um, what other jobs should they check out to prepare? And, and Cam's kind of question is like, what about investment banking or private equity or hedge funds? Like, why not think about those first uh, as an entry level or which one of those would be the best ones to prepare them? Yeah, totally. So this is a real, I get this question a lot. It's a really, it's a really important one. So um, I'm going to give, I'm going to give the, the most nuanced answer that I can because I think it's so important. So number one is any, any industry and any role can map to venture, which I know is not a great place to start, but like I can talk you through how and why, whether it's choosing to go to business school, taking a product role. And so, so I can, I can feel, you know, basically like what, what are the ways each role maps to venture? But the reality is if you, again, if you work at Christie's, I can, I can talk to you about how and why, you know, you can find a venture role, right? Like if you, uh, you know, are literally, you know, like a fourth year, you know, medical student, you know what I mean? I can tell you um, where you can head. So, so here's what I, I do think is important. Um, uh, number one, you know, the, the ability to have a sourcing and a diligence method and skill set is I think the way you want to mentally anchor, which is from a sourcing side, think about the network of founders or the ways that you're going to be able to have a calling card for reaching out to folks. And then a, from a diligence perspective, it's just, you know, what are the skills that you can use for analyzing and assessing, you know, companies and opportunities. So this is where I'll double click into like private equity and investment banking. Your diligence skills are going to be incredible. You're going to be able to tease out a market, tease out cohorts, you know what I mean? Like, oh my gosh, they're this, this, and this financial, you know, assumption in their projections. So let's toss that out. Their revenue is really going to look like this. If that's the case, then we're going to pay this. And you know what I mean? Like that's, so that's the skill set you'd build there. And on the sourcing side, just think about, you know, how are you have developing a calling card for reaching out to, to founders? And so that's like, you know, the, I know everything about this thematic area. It's like any business that wants to compete heads up with Amazon. I know like the, you know, ch ch I know the checklist for doing that. So consumer commerce companies, I'll have always have something to talk about with them. So I think those are two really important kind of framing for any, any role that you're going to choose to take. The important piece to do in parallel to any of these things is start forming trusted relationships with some folks in venture. Start, you know, as soon as possible, because if you can build up time and, and, and touch points with them, whether they choose to hire in the future or someone else chooses to hire, like you're going to have, again, we talked about the ability to build a network here. 
it's open to anyone and everyone, you know what I mean? So just start, just pick a few of them. Hey, I was going through like your team's profile. Looks like a lot of folks worked in private equity. You know, that's the, you know, the role that I'm taking this summer. You know what I mean? I'd love to just take two minutes and, and walk through like your experience and how your PE skills, you know what I mean? are mapping your venture role. By the way, I took a look through your portfolio and looked at these three companies, you know, all three of which look super interesting to me. And I think I have friends that might want to work at. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah, we just connected the whole, the whole, the whole dot. So, so that's what I would say the, the, in the, the last piece. So, so build the trusted relationships in, in parallel. And then the last piece is maintain and build founder empathy in parallel. Because this is the one thing that some of these industries don't necessarily teach you right? Like it, depending on your level of customer facing and found, you know, kind of, you know, um, forward facing, you may not be developing reps in being, um, you know, really just, you know, empathetic to founders. I think that's really, really important. Um, and I think certain roles have that embedded, certain roles don't, but just find your three friends that are starting companies and say, hey, I want to do a monthly call with you where you come with any questions or any challenge areas. And I try to figure out how to be helpful to you with what I'm learning from my job and my network. It's like, cause that's, that's what you want. So just, you want to build founder empathy and you want to build the relationships in parallel to this kind of two key skill areas for any role that you're in. I think the thing I like most about this lunch and learn, if I can just give you a compliment is all of your advice is so actionable. Like it's not out of reach. Everything you've just described is something every single person on this call can do. And I hope they will do it if they're looking to get into entrepreneurship or VC. I love it. So Peter, on behalf of everyone watching, on behalf of the whole way up team, thank you so much for doing this. You are someone who a lot of people look up to in DC, but also just in the world of operations. Uh, your, your thought leadership around, you know, different industries that you're focused on is incredible. So uh, I'm seeing people comment, this is awesome. So thank you so much again for doing this. I know you're insanely busy. You sit on a lot of boards of companies that are total rocket ships. So I really appreciate you doing this. And if people want to follow you, is it Twitter, LinkedIn? Like, what's the best way for them to kind of follow you? Twitter and LinkedIn are perfect. Yeah, my Twitter handle is Bad Boy Boyce from my time working at Bad Boy Entertainment. So please find me there. Um, and then LinkedIn, you know, I'm, I'm very much available. Um, so yeah, please, um, definitely, definitely reach out. And I'm so grateful to do this. My favorite thing is seeing folks enter the world of startups, venture capital, and everything in between. So anything I can do, I mean, I live this. I remember the people that, you know, were helpful to me on the journey. So any role I can play, you know, it's my pleasure. Thank you again, Liz, for pulling all this together. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. And to everyone watching, please do share your takeaways online. We'd love to see them. Peter, you're the best. Good luck with everything. I'm sure we'll talk soon. And uh, I know you just got a new puppy. So good luck with yes. your new puppy as well. <laughs> you rock. All right. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Ciao. Bye.